appreciate you coming this morning. Coffee will be ready in a couple of minutes. Oh, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Now, I ran a sales report from the area. Wrote down a suggested asking price for the house. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Mm-hmm. Now, what did you say your husband did for a living? Um, well, we actually haven't talked about that, but he's a sales rep for Brightwell Pharmaceuticals. Mm-hmm. And uh, where did you say you attended church? Well, we occasionally attend Riverdale Community. Mm-hmm. So you would say you know the Lord? Yes, I would say I know the Lord. You think the Lord is okay with this asking price? Mm-hmm. And you have children? Miss Clara, my husband Tony and I have been married for 16 years. We have one daughter, her name is Danielle, and she's 10. She enjoys pop music and ice cream and jumping rope. Oh, well, that, that's good to know. Now, you say you attend church occasionally. Is that because your pastor only preaches occasionally? Miss Clara, I really would like to help you sell your house. That's why I'm here. As far as my faith is concerned, I believe in God, just like most people. He's very important to me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me get our coffee. <laughs> so if I asked you what your prayer life was like, would you say that it was hot or cold? I don't know that I would say it's hot. I mean, we're like most people. We have full schedules. We work. But I, I would consider myself a spiritual person. I'm not hot, but I'm not cold either. Just, you know, somewhere in the middle. Here you go. I've got cream or sugar if you need Oh, no, thank you. I like it black. Miss Clara, you like your coffee room temperature? No, baby, mine's hot. Have you ever wondered why we close our eyes when we pray or bow our heads? It's not commanded in Scripture that we would do those things, but it can help us give reverence to an unseen God who is sovereign and king, a sign of respect and awe. But secondly, it's less about awe and worship than it is about practical distractions constantly filling our eyes, ears, and minds. Perhaps it's akin to closing the door and shutting ourselves in and the world out so that as believers, we can truly be near God. Today in our scriptures, we are going to encounter the, what, the where of our proper prayer life. The Bible communicates that we should pray without ceasing, and that implies that anywhere is a good place to pray, though this may obviously mean silent prayer in many contexts. Spontaneous prayer should be a part of our daily response to each situation that we face. However, Scripture also communicates that we should have scheduled prayer as well. Jesus modeled this by having a secluded place to talk to his father. When Jesus said we should shut the door, he was inviting us to focused intimacy with God. By shutting out the world when we pray, we may be truly committed to beseeching and receiving from God in that moment. Let's today discuss three key reasons to shut the door. The one to, to our closet, as well as the one to our mind. We're in our second message in the sermon series, War Room, and the message today is where you pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8 is our text. I want to read just verse 6, which is the focus of the message this morning. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. I want to just share with you, just for a moment, a little bit about my own personal journey with private and personal prayer. Of course, I've been in the ministry for 42 years, and some people just assume, well, 
prayer comes easy for preachers, but we're human beings too. I, I wasn't actually born a preacher. I was born a baby. So, uh, you know, I grew up as a child. And, and so uh, the, the, the journey of, of uh, prayer is uh, one like anyone else's, ups and downs. And uh, there have been times when I've prayed more and times when I have prayed less. About uh, 24 years ago, when we moved to Bridgeton, New Jersey, it was our fourth pastorate, I uh, started a, a new uh, aspect of my life. It, co- it was a combination of uh, getting up at 5.30 in the morning and having specific time for exercise and specific time for prayer. And I've continued that uh, with greater and lesser success uh, during that, that entire 24 uh, hour period. Uh, when we were in Bridgeton, uh, the, we lived in the parsonage right there on the property, and my wife w- w- was, uh, worked in the office, and I would stay home and have the, the quiet time there in the home. And also, we didn't have a school and a lot of other things going on, and so throughout the day or any, whenever I went to, I could just walk out into uh, the sanctuary there in that church, and uh, I would go through and lay hands on, on the pews and, and pray for the people. When I came here, it was a big change. There's never a time that somebody isn't around unless I come over here at 3 o'clock in the morning or something, and I wouldn't be surprised to find somebody here then. But there's always something going on in the life of the church, and I had, have had uh, difficulty finding a place to get alone in prayer. And so what I began to do was to, just to stay home. If you come at 8 o'clock in the morning, you will find my wife at work, but you won't find me here because I have been uh, at home and, and having my prayer time at home. It's where I can have some quiet. And uh, recently, there's a room that's uh, been opened in, in the building that I've been able to use, and so when I come to the office, the first thing that I'm able to do is come and pray, and uh, the worship center, most mornings, is open, and so I can come through and pray. The sad part is, that's almost eight years into my ministry here, that uh, I finally feel comfortable to walk in here, not feel like I'm going to be interrupted while I'm praying for you. And so what I'm trying to point out is that even though I'm a pastor, it still takes intentionality. Sometimes I'm better at it. Sometimes I'm not as good at it. The, the, the person in our family that is really good at it is my wife. She's the prayer warrior in our family. Uh, she prayed our children into existence. She prayed our children through elementary school. She prayed our children through uh, the, the high school years, through all the sports years. Uh, she prayed our children through college. Uh, one went to college in South Carolina. The other one went to Indiana. When they were on the road, she would pray all night. Now, for me, I pray, and then I go to sleep. But uh, she would be awake and praying for them uh, throughout the night and saved them from many uh, dif- difficulties and tragedies. Uh, she, ha- she has prayed our daughter-in-laws into the family. She prayed some other girls out of the family. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so that, that, was, that was a process too. But if you were to talk to our boys and, and even their wives, uh, if, if you'd say, if you need something, who would you call? They would say they would call their mother. And uh, they do. Uh, they send text messages or they'll call whenever there's anything. And they're in their 30s now. But they still, when they have a prayer need, uh, look to her for, for prayer. And so... What I'm trying to share with you is that uh, the, the struggle is real, uh, and it's, it's real for all of us. We're all human, and we have a tendency to get our eyes on what we can see, to listen to what we can hear in this world, and uh, we are distracted. And Satan wants to distract us. Even, even when you get alone in that prayer room, as Max Arcata said last week, our minds go in a million directions, and we can think of a thousand things that we could be doing and, and uh, things that need to be done in that time and and tries to distract us. But in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the comparison of people who who like to be seen and like to be heard and like to be thought of as being spiritual, and and so they put on a pretense uh, of prayer rather than being sincere in prayer. And he's saying, rather than that, you should go alone in prayer. And and so when you go alone in prayer, you're shutting the door, and, and that shifts the focus off of others. 
it, it, it shifts the focus off of others. Shutting the door to pray in private is actually the opposite of the hypocrites who pray to be seen by others. In Matthew 6, 5, it says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when we get alone with God, there's no one to impress, and we can simply focus on God. Focusing on others and what they may think uh, why, and why it matters is a trap. It's something that, that Satan uh, tries to trap us in, that instead of focusing on God, we're, th- we're focusing on other people. I've had some people say, I, I can't pray out loud. And, and I say, well, why, why can't you pray out loud? Well, well somebody's going to laugh at me. My, my question to that is, have you ever laughed at anyone else when they prayed? Well, no. No, you haven't. No one's going to laugh at you when you pray. And Jesus isn't forbidding public prayers. Pub- public prayers is part of worship. It was in the Old Testament. It is in the New Testament. He's not saying that there should never be public prayers. But the fact that, of what he is saying is you shouldn't care what other people think. You're not praying to impress other people. You're praying to God. And going alone and shutting the door helps us to to have that focus. We're we're not uh, trying to impress someone else, but we are trying to have a relationship with the Lord. In Proverbs 29, verse 25, it says, Fear the Lord. Excuse me. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Let me read that again. Proverbs 29, 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. Trusting in God alone is to his glory and to our greatest benefit. We can come alone with God and we can glorify him. And in the process, we receive the benefit. The second thing that we notice is that shutting the door shifts the focus off of self. Okay? We, we are taking time away from all the things in this world that we think we should be doing or what we want to do or what our responsibilities are, and we're making our relationship with God a priority. In private prayer, God's Holy Spirit may reveal more of who we are and more of who he is and how to walk in the light of his word. None of us are able to please God in our own strength. None of us are able to live righteous lives or holy lives in our own strength. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 25, verses 8 through 11, the psalmist wrote, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. As we examine our own selves... In prayer, God can show us areas that we need to change, maybe some blind spots that we don't even know uh, that, that need to be changed. And I would say if you're a new believer this morning, that God has a way of showing you and speaking to you about what is right and what is wrong. You, you may be a brand new believer and, and you may say, I don't know how to follow Jesus. I don't know how to live a life that pleases him. And I would encourage you, get alone with God, pray, ask him to help you, and he will show you. And you know what, church? They don't need us pointing out every little fault that they have. Everything that we've learned over the last 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we need to pray for them. Keith Drury is a a great leader in the Wesleyan church, and he's often said, sometimes we just have to act like there's a Holy Spirit or something, you know. The Holy Spirit can, can speak to our hearts, and he can speak to the hearts of new Christians and help them to discern what God would have for them. It is in prayer that we discover our mind is actually divided in the first place. We live in this temporary, physical, material world, and 
it distracts us. And even when we pray and even when in sincerity we, we choose and desire to please God, we still live in this world and our minds are divided. And, and in prayer, that is pointed out to us. And then and only then can we beg God to show us his way and the right path for us. In Psalm 86, verse 11, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me undivided, an undivided heart that I may fear your name. In 1 John chapter 1, it tells us that we are to walk in the light. And, and as we walk in the light, he will reveal more light to us. And if you get alone in prayer and, and you want God to show you, okay, what should I do? How should I live? The question is, what are you doing with what you already know? Are you living up to what you already know? God's not going to show you the next step until you complete what he has already shown you to do in your life. And, and, and we need to get away with the, Lord, with the Lord. Teach me your way, O Lord. And I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. We have to continue to be walking with the Lord as, as he reveals it to us so that we can see uh, other things revealed to us. Oswald Chamber wrote in his great devotional classic, My Utmost for His Highest, Unless you learn to open the door of your life completely and let God in from your first waking moment of each new day, you will be working on the wrong level throughout the day. But if you will swing the door of your life fully open and pray to your Father who is in the secret place, every public thing in your life will be marked by the lasting imprint of the presence of God. You might say, well, I have to be to work at a certain time. I have responsibilities. I have to help my children get ready for school. I have this to do and that to do. No matter who we are, we may not be able to spend a, an hour alone with God. We may not be able to, to we, we might not be morning people. May, maybe you're the kind of person that gets up 10 minutes before you're to be at work and you have a 15 minute drive. Uh, that, you know, uh, but anyone can take the time and say, dear God, help me to live this day for your glory. And maybe the way your life is, maybe the evening's a better time to pray for you. Or maybe the last thing before you go to bed, it's not about the time. But to start that day by saying, God, use me today. Help me to live this day for your glory. Help me to live this day uh, to, to bring glory to you. We have such a great opportunity, and yet we neglect it. We go out and, and, and we face this world and all the problems of this world, and the great God, the creator and the sustainer of the universe is right here, ready to use us, ready to fill us with his presence and with his power to accomplish what he wants us to do in our lives, and we neglect this wonderful opportunity that we have. We can fight our battles ourselves if we want to, but God is right here if we would just open our heart and allow him to help us. And the third thing that we notice is that shutting the door shifts God into his place of priority. It shifts God into his place of priority. God's place of priority is he, he is number one. But in this world, that is not the normal place for him to be. Uh, we, it's what we see, it's, it's what's going on around us, it's, it's our problems. We, we've, got a, we've got problems to solve, we've got work to get done, and, and those are often the things that we put into priority, but shutting the door shifts God to the place of priority that he should have. All God, although God is everywhere, we are more aware of his presence in the secret place. We sang it this morning. Help us to be more aware of your presence. And to do that, we have to be intentional. We, we have to take the time and shift our mind and think about God. If we just go through the day and, and we do our work and we deal with our families and we deal with our problems and, and uh, we, we just go through life, we're not going to experience God we're not, he's there, but we're not going to be aware of his presence. We have to focus on God 
by shutting the door and getting alone with him in prayer. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, it says, after he had dismissed them, he went up to on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. That's a testimony of Jesus. Jesus left the, the others, and he went on a mountainside to pray alone. We are told that we should all put down our phones while we're driving, at dinner, in theaters, in church, unless you're using your device for your Bible, and when engaged in quality time with others. When you silence the ringer or eliminate the noise in order to focus on the face in front of you, it's an illustration of worth. And that's what it is when we, when we schedule a time, when we say, this is my time with God. This is when I'm going to pray. This is where I'm going to pray. And we make that a priority of our life. It is saying to God that he is important in our lives. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, one of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Again, referring to Max Lucado's book, Before Amen, Lucado writes, you actually have a seat with Christ in the heavens, according to Ephesians 2.6. You don't have a seat on the Supreme Court of the United States or in the House of Representatives. You have one far more strategic. You have a seat in the government of God. Like a congressman, you represent a district. You speak on behalf of your family, your neighborhood, or softball team. Your sphere of influence is your region. As you grow in faith, your district expands. God burdens you with a concern for orphans, distant lands, or needy people. You respond to these promptings by prayer. Father, they need help. If Jesus needed to get away and pray, how much more do we need to get away and pray today. In Luke 5, 16, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In Luke 22, verses 41 to 44, it says, he withdrew about a stone's throw from them and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. That last illustration, that last scripture, is of Jesus in the Garden of the Gethsemane. It was the the night before he was crucified. It was just moments before he was arrested and taken and and tried and and, uh, persecuted. And and I want to just for a moment just think about That night, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the disciples slept. And Jesus was able to yield himself to the will of God, to be beaten and scorned, to to be accused falsely without ever opening his mouth, to carry his cross through the street, to be put on a cross and to die because he prayed because he prayed for the Father's help. The disciples in that garden fell asleep. Several times Jesus awoke them and said, can you not just wait with me in prayer for one hour? And they fell back to sleep. And what did the disciples do? They cowered, they ran away. Uh, Peter denied Christ. The others fled from the cross. After the resurrection, we talked about this a few weeks ago, they they are found in a a room, locked away for fear of what the Jews and the Romans were going to do to them. They were powerless. But the same power that was available to Jesus Christ through prayer was available to the disciples. And that same power is available to us. What a difference our lives would make if we would simply go to God in prayer? What would change in our attitudes? What would change in in our relationships? What would change in the, the problems that we face if we took our problems to God instead of trying to solve them all on our own? I want to show another video clip from the, the movie War Room. 
to help us to understand what I'm talking about here this morning. There's not room for you and God on the throne of your heart. It's either him or it's you. You need to step down. Now, if you want victory, you're going to have to first surrender. But Miss Clara, do I just back off and choose to forgive and then just let him walk all over me? God is a good defense attorney. Trust it to him. And then you can turn your focus to the real enemy. The real enemy? The one that wants to remain hidden. The one that wants to distract you and deceive you and divide you from the Lord and your husband. You see, that's how it works. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he is stealing your joy. He is killing your faith. And he's trying to destroy your family. If I were you, I would get my heart right with God. And you need to do your fight in prayer. And you need to kick the real enemy out of your home with the word of God. It's time for you to fight a little bit. It's time for you to fight for your marriage. It's time for you to fight the real enemy. It's time for you to take off the gloves and do it. We have an enemy that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to fight. Not to fight the people around us. Not to fight our spouses. Not to fight our children. Not to fight our neighbors. Not to fight our government. But to fight for them in prayer. Do you have a spouse who is, a follower, who is not a follower of Jesus Christ? Fight for them in prayer. Do you have a child of any age who is living in rebellion against you and God? Fight for them in prayer. Do you have a parent who has never come to Christ in confession and repentance? Fight for them in prayer. Do you have a strained or broken relationship with your spouse or children? Fight for them in prayer. Do you have adult children who have the responsibility of raising your grandchildren but are living a lifestyle that is contrary to Christian values? Fight for them in prayer because prayer is our opportunity and it is our responsibility. If we, as the church of Jesus Christ, don't pray, who will? If, if we don't pray for our unsaved spouse, if we don't pray for our unsaved children, if we don't pray for our marriages, if we don't pray for our grandchildren, if we don't pray for our families, who will? What an opportunity, but what a responsibility we have in prayer. How much difference could our homes be if we prayed? How much difference could our families be if we prayed? How much difference could our neighborhoods be if we prayed? How much different would our nation be if we prayed? The greatest indictment against the church of Jesus Christ in these times is that we're too busy to pray. If you want to have an empty building, call for a prayer meeting. Do we pray? Do we pray when we're alone. Now, I know that there are many people that do, but the premise of this, could we pray more? Could we pray more fervently? Could we pray more sincerely? Could we pray and put God first? Many times, we try to solve our problems, and when it becomes evident that we can't solve them, then we go to God in prayer. What if we went to God first? What if we took our needs and our burdens and our problems to God to begin with? Begin the day with prayer. Begin the response to a problem in prayer. What a difference that God could make. A great privilege, but also a great responsibility. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, you've never just made a decision to follow him, and, and you're facing life all alone, and you're facing all kinds of battles and all kinds of strife in your life, 
I want to tell you this morning, you can come to Jesus and you can have this power that we've talked about through prayer if you will have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I invite you this morning, in my closing prayer, I'm going to include a prayer of repentance and I'm going to ask for forgiveness of sin and and repentance and turning away from sin. And if you believe that this is what you need and what you want in your life, if you've never received Jesus as Savior, you've never chosen to follow him, I would encourage you this morning to pray this prayer with me in your hearts as well. Let's stand together. You don't have to pray it out loud. Just pray and ask Jesus to forgive your sin and to turn away from your sin. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your great love for us. The Bible tells us that even before the world was created, before the first human being was created, before the fall of mankind through sin, that you chose that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins to make the way for us to be forgiven. Lord, you want and desire so greatly to have a relationship with each of us. And Lord, there are many of us today who are Christians, who, who perhaps could trace back the, the decades of our lives and say, it was many years ago that I gave my heart to Jesus. And yet, our prayer life has grown lukewarm. We, we don't pray like we used to. We don't pray with the fervency we once prayed. We've allowed the, the busyness of the times and the technology and, and the material things uh, of, this, of this time to eat up our days and to make us a prayerless people. Lord, we repent this morning. And Lord, we choose to, to be more of people of prayer than we've ever been. And Lord, perhaps there are those among us this morning who have never chosen to follow Jesus. They've never asked Jesus to be their Savior. And Lord, I pray this morning that they would pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess that I was born in sin like all human beings, and I confess that I have committed acts of sin. And so today, I turn from my sin, and I come to you as the only one who can forgive my sins and take away my sins. And and I repent, I turn from my sin and I turn to you and I ask you to forgive my sin. And I choose today to commit myself to be a follower of you, to serve you and to follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I pray for each of these individuals that pray this prayer And whether we've been Christians for decades or whether we just prayed that prayer right now, I pray that you would help us all, dear Lord, to make prayer a priority in our life because if we will pray, it will change our circumstance. It will change our family. It'll change our church. It'll change our nation. If we will but pray and seek your face, that we would have a closer, more intimate, more real relationship with you. May you be glorified. Help us, Lord, not to fight with our families. Help us not to fight in the church. Help us not to just fight our government, but help us, dear Lord, to fight for them in prayer. And we'll give you glory and praise for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.